All right, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar about the arrest of Meng Wanzhou and the new Cold War on China. Before we get started, I want to give some instructions on how to set up language interpretation for this event. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on the interpretation button, which looks like a globe. Then select the language you would like, English, French, or Mandarin, which is labeled as Chinese on Zoom. If you are joining from a mobile device, click the three dots, then tap language interpretation, then tap the language you would like to hear, and then click done. If you run into any problems with interpretation, please let us know in the chat. A reminder to our speakers to please speak slowly and clearly to make interpretation easier. Rachel, the French instructions, please. Bonsoir, bienvenue à tout le monde. Merci pour nous rejoindre pour cet événement. Merci beaucoup à Véronique Théron et Marina Malkova pour faire l'interprétation simultanée entre anglais et français pour cet événement. Chaque personne doit lui-même sélectionner si vous voulez écouter ou en anglais ou en français. Si vous souhaitez écouter en français, puis cliquez sur l'icône en bas marqué l'interprétation de langue et puis sélectionnez le français. L'icône, c'est typiquement un globe terrestre. S'il y a n'importe quel problème avec l'interprétation, veuillez nous laisser savoir en nous écrivant utilisant euh, la fonction chat. C'est comme ça aussi que vous aurez l'occasion de poser des questions aux panélistes après que toutes les présentations soient faites. And the Mandarin instructions, please. Interpretation标志，点进去选择Chinese，您就可以听到中文翻译了。同时，您还可以点击Mute Original Audio，消除原声，这样就可以不受原语英文的干扰了。谢谢。Great, thank you so much. Again, welcome to today's webinar concerning the arrest of Meng Wanzhou and the new Cold War on China. My name is Greta Zaro and I'm the organizing director for World Beyond War. World Beyond War is a global grassroots network of volunteers, chapters, and affiliated organizations across 189 countries worldwide, working to abolish the institution of war and to replace it with a just and sustainable peace. You can learn more about our work at worldbeyondwar.org. World Beyond War is excited to be hosting today's webinar on our Zoom platform and providing technical support for this event. This event is being organized by the Cross Canada Campaign to Free Meng Wanzhou. We are excited to be welcoming participants from around the world for this discussion. Thank you to the Canada Files, our official media sponsor for today's event. And thank you so much to our language interpreters for their amazing help with today's event. We are recording and live streaming this webinar to World Beyond War's Facebook page, which you can access at facebook.com slash worldbeyondwar. And we will send out the recording to all participants afterwards. After the speaker's presentation, we will have Q&A. Chat will be turned off during the presentations and we will open up the chat box during the Q&A period. We won't be using the raise hand feature today, so please do direct your questions to the chat box instead. Radhika Desai will be today's moderator. Radhika is professor at the Department of Political Studies, University of Manitoba, and director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group. Radhika, take it away. Thanks very much, uh, Rachel, uh, sorry, Greta, and uh, thanks to everyone for being here for this very, very important discussion. Um, as, uh, uh, as, as Greta has said, I'm, uh, I'm speaking here from, to you from Manitoba, which is uh, located on the original homelands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, today's event um, is uh, uh, entitled Free Meng Wangzhou and the subtitle is The Arrest of Meng Wangzhou and the New Cold War Against China. 
It is sponsored by the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, the Canadian Peace Congress, World Beyond War, and Just Peace Advocates. The presentations, including introductions, will take about 50 minutes to an hour. After that, we will have questions and answers, beginning with live questions from the pre-registered media who are here, uh, and, uh, and an announcement from one of our sponsors. Then, as Greta has pointed out, the chat will be open. And at that time, please make sure you use the opportunity to submit written questions to Brendan Stone through the chat, or if you prefer, you can email your questions uh, even while the, the, uh, the conversation, the, um, the speech speeches are going on, you can email questions to uh, Brendan Stone of Hamilton Peace Coalition, sorry, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. And the email address is hcsw at cojeco.ca. Uh, if somebody could please type it in the chat, that would be great. H-C-S-W C-O-G-E-C-O dot C-A. Okay, let me say a few words to introduce the event. China has uh, made, uh, uh, China, China's rise has made it an increasingly contentious issues. Relations between China and the West are characterized by trade and technology wars, military competition is sharpening. And of course, um, there are uh, mounting uh, accusations and allegations of human rights violations, even genocide if the Canadian parliament is to be believed spying, hybrid wars, and industrial and social sabotage. Um, in this uh, new Cold War, which the United States has launched, uh, uh, which President Trump launched, and which uh, President Biden seems to, uh, 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 to, to seek to pursue with equal zeal, if with slightly different tactics. Um, in, under Biden, particularly, the United States is seeking to mobilize allies via old, alliance, uh, while old alliances such as NATO and new ones such as the so-called Quad in the Indo-Pacific region involving countries such as Japan, Australia, and India. Um, in the context of the new Cold War, there is also rising uh, and uh, uh, racism against uh, uh, Chinese and generally Asian Americans. So it has become increasingly a very worrying issue, a very important issue. Today's event focuses on one very particular issue in, in this new Cold War. It involves Canada, and it is an event that has involved Canada uh, up to the gills, basically, in US, the US's trade and technology wars with China. It is the arrest of Meng Wanzhou, the uh, chief financial officer of Huawei, the uh, noted telecommunications company against which the United States has uh, uh, made a number of allegations and whose competition American telecommunications companies seem to fear a great deal. Uh, Meng Wanzhou was uh, uh, arrested on 1st December 2018 and faces potential extradition to the United States on charges of fraud, conspiracy to, uh, uh, a conspiracy to commit fraud to circumvent US sanctions on Iran. So you can see it's a sort of world girding issue. And there are many questions that hang around the matter. Why was it that Canada arrested Meng Wanzhou, even though between the time the arrest warrant was issued and uh, 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 the time she was arrested, which was a gap of about three months, uh, uh, Ms. Wang, uh, Ms. Meng had traveled to at least a dozen other countries. There were also many ir irregularities of procedure in her arrest. There is much to suggest that the US's original charges against Meng were politically motivated and aimed at Huawei rather than any serious procedural regularities of any sort or fraud or conspiracy. There is, of course, the issue of former President uh, Trump's avowed threat to interfere in the process in order to gain political advantage against Canada in completely unrelated negotiations. There are questions of jurisdiction, given that the, the, none of the crimes of which uh, 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 Ms. Meng was accused have taken place on US territory. There is the issue of whether US charges against her would constitute a crime against Canada, which would be the only ground on which Canada, Canadian extradition laws would allow Canada to extradite Meng. But, uh, this is particularly an issue because Canada is not party to the uh, American sanctions against uh, Iran. There is also the issue of the political character 
uh, of uh, of the of the U.S. charges because if it were they were shown to be political in nature, then ca Canadian extradition law explicitly um, uh, explicitly prohibits extradition on for, uh, on the grounds of political uh, charges. There are many many other such issues. I won't go on. We have a, a very very distinguished and impressive list of speakers who are going to enlighten us on all these issues. Ultimately, the question for Canadians is: Should Canada be involved in making the world a more dangerous place? by involving, it, involving Canada in the new Cold War against China? Should we be permitting our legal processes to be corrupted in order to please the Americans? And should we continue with the West's uh, uh, act of getting on a high horse about democracy and human rights and generally vitiating relations with China? Or should we choose to deal with Canada in a cooperative spirit, uh, both in order to to, to, to attain mutual economic gain, as well as with a determination to deal with human rights issues and human rights wrongs everywhere, in China, in Canada, and everywhere. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is John Ross, and I consider John to be one of the most trenchant analysts of China, its economy, and its relations with the West. If you haven't already seen it, please go to his blog, learningfromchina.net, all one word, learningfromchina.net. He is a journalist, a blogger, an academic, an economic commentator. He was at one point an advisor to the left-wing mayor of London uh, from 2000 to 2008, uh, Ken Livingston. And today he has uh, and since then, he has spent much of his time in China and has become an extremely well-known commentator on, chi on, on, uh, on China, the Chinese economy, and the relations between China and the West. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at uh, uh, Renmin University. Uh, he has also written several books in Chinese, and I'm told that he's one of the most highly followed uh, 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 he has one of the most highly followed accounts on Weibo, which is the French version of, uh, I guess, French, uh, sorry, not French, Chinese version of um, uh, Twitter or Facebook or something like that. So uh, with that said, uh, take it away, John. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, others are going to speak on different aspects of this case um, about the legal violations on the interference of the Trump administration. Uh, but I'm an economist and I used to advise companies and uh, taught MBA students, etc. So that's going to define the angle that I'm going to take. I want to speak on the real reasons for the rest of Meng Wanzhou and the attacks on Huawei and who pays the price for it. To give the answers to the questions first, the reason for the attack on Ms. Meng is because Huawei is the most efficient telecommunications manufacturer in the world. And the people who pay the price are not just in China, but all of us in the West. Um, therefore, I, I want to basically speak on the following topics. Why is it clear this is a frame up very briefly? What is Huawei and Meng Wanzhou really being tried for? And third, why is this against the interest not only of China, but of the people of the West? That includes Britain, my own country, Canada and the United States. Okay. Firstly, let's deal why this is an absurd frame up. Uh, legal experts can deal with the details far better than I can. I would simply refer you, to, for example, the legal advice and international trading um, by uh, Dr. Atif Kabursi. The, uh, I thought it was quite well put, actually, in a recent CBC article, which noted it was likely, to quote, I quote, American prosecutors are reaching far beyond their jurisdiction by a Chinese, Chinese, China, Chinese citizen for a conversation that took place in Hong Kong with an executive for an English bank. But there's more fundamental things than these legal things. Firstly, let's just consider what has happened since the international financial crisis. Literally tens of billions of dollars of fines have been paid by numerous Western banks for all sorts of extraordinary violations with penalties, in some cases, the individual penalties of billions of dollars. Not one single CEO or CFO of any of these companies which were charged with uh, offences which carried enormous fines has been individually charged, unlike Ms. Mung. So this is therefore a frame up of an individual which has never been carried out against the officials of Western companies for very serious convictions, not many accusations. Most absurd of all 
however, is the accusation against Huawei itself. Now, I've been teaching uh, on Huawei in Chinese universities for 12 years now and studying it before that. It's obvious that any, any product which is produced by Huawei is tested by security services. I don't actually object to this. I mean, security services get up to a number of things which are objectionable. But actually, the question of testing the security of the telecommunications uh, equipment supplied by companies is perfectly legitimate and reasonable. And uh, the Canadian uh, uh, security service will do it. The American ones will do it. And the Chinese ones also do it. It would only be necessary to find one example of a violation of security by Huawei, and the company would be destroyed. Nobody would be able to do it. And through, nobody would be able to use it. Throughout that whole period of time this is Huawei, not one single piece of evidence has been found on that. And we can, as I said, we can be sure that the most efficient security services in the world go through it in the most thorough detail. So therefore, the first thing we can say is this whole thing, the accusation against Huawei and the individual charge against Ms. Meng is a uh, frame up. What is therefore she really being charged, tried for? It's because Huawei is the most successful telecommunications manufacturer in the world. Let's take the ridiculous claim that uh, put by the United States supplementary thing that Chinese companies, including Huawei, are stealing technology from the United States. As it was put by the CEO of um, uh, Huawei, or Engineering Fei, very well, this is ridiculous. Huawei produces things which the United States can't produce. No US company can produce the 5G equipment that Huawei can. If there's any technological stealing going on, it's going on, it will be stealing from Huawei, not stealing by Huawei. Okay. I've said I've been teaching on Huawei because it's such a successful company for a very long time. I've been teach before I went to Chongyang Institute where I am now, I was teaching MBA students in uh, Shanghai. And of course, at that time, I started in 2009. At that time, I was teaching about Huawei. The Huawei at that time was not the Huawei that it is today. Huawei today is the largest telecommunications manufacturer in the world. At that time, it was a rising company, but it was nothing like what it is today. Okay. What I already knew by that time was, because I taught Western telecommunications people as well, companies, um, executives from companies, as part of the courses for foreign students, was... They said, we're in despair when we go to compete against Huawei in tenders because we know we're gonna lose. Uh, they will produce this equipment with the same quality and it will be substantially cheaper than ours, normally 20 to 30% cheaper. We might as well save the airfare and not go because we know that they're gonna win. Why, well, and this was already there at that time, this is in 2009 when I started to teach this, right, okay. Why was it so successful? It was because of Huawei's superior strategy. Go back to the when Huawei was founded in, in 1987, and then its development during the 1990s. At that time, China was a low-income country. The Western company, com uh, companies were very willing to uh, incorporate into telecommunication systems to wire up, if you want to use that terminology, the first tier, what are called the first tier cities in China, that is Beijing, Shanghai. They thought China was too poor to bother to go into the fourth, what are called the fourth and fifth tier cities, let alone the villages. Huawei integrated into the telecommunication system, wired up the whole of China. It understood the dynamic of the Chinese economy much better than the Western companies. And it acquired massive scale. This was the first step forward in the construction of the company. It wired up the whole of China and therefore a huge, had a huge scale, scale of operation. But it was planning for the long term even then. Huawei was always used at least 10% of its revenue for R&D every single year. It also has a very clear personnel policy. It pays higher than other companies in China and it has an extremely educated workforce. If we take now today, Huawei's got 15,000 employees engaged in basic research, including over 700 PhDs in mathematics and over 5,000 PhDs specialized in engineering. It was in China of terminology that was called the, the countryside surrounds the cities. 
that means that it wired up fourth, fifth, third, second uh, cities, tier cities, and then began to develop also further in, in Beijing, Shanghai, etc. This was also the strategy that it used internationally when it started from basically 1999. Again, I'll quote Ren Zhenfei, the CEO. If we don't set a goal and direction for the company's development, we will not establish the faith of the customer and also the staff's future and fighting spirit. If we don't want Huawei to wither away, we must have a conception of globalization. That globalization strategy was again, more smart than the Western companies. It started off in relatively underdeveloped countries. In fact, some of its first places were in like countries such as Laos and Yemen. It didn't get its first, it didn't get its first contract into an advanced country until 2001 in Germany. Then it got into with British Telecom in 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 britain okay by this globalization strategy starting in developing countries was extremely successful by 2005 huawei's domestic uh, orders were less than its foreign orders by 2010 huawei was being used in 100 companies and 45 of the world's top 50 telecoms operators by 2012 75 percent of huawei's uh, in revenue came from abroad. And now, of course, it's the world's largest telecommunications manufacturer in the world, and one of the world's largest handset manufacturers. In other words, it succeeded because it had a superior strategy, a superior policy on personnel, and a supe superior delivery to other companies. That's the real accusation against Huawei. The real accusation against Huawei is it's the world's most efficient telecommunications company. Now, who's paying for this price? Who's paying the price for this attack on Huawei? Obviously, it's doing some damage to the company, but it's damaging you, me, everybody in the West. Why? Because it's forcing us to pay more for our telecommunications. Let me just take you the example of my own country. As I say, Huawei's been participated in, B in BT, the main telecoms communicator, and other companies now for a considerable period. When 5G was launched, the British gov government wanted Huawei to participate in it. Why? Because it's estimated that Huawei participating in the 5G network would save between five and $10 billion and would deliver telecommunications, 5G telecommunications two years pre earlier than if Huawei was kept out of the system. It was persuaded, forced, to abandon the use of Huawei for the British government and therefore the British people, by the US government, and therefore the British people are going to pay five to $10 billion more in telecommunications charges and get 5G later than if Huawei was involved. So in other words, this is not just an attack on Chinese companies, this is an attack on people in Britain. And I'm sure there'll be a similar situation will be taking place for Canada, it will be for Australia and all countries which are kept out of it. Finally, what's going to be the, which Huawei is kept out of? Finally, what is going to be the result of this internationally? The United States will succeed, unfortunately, in getting some of its closest allies to cut Huawei out. It succeeded in doing so in Britain at the cost to the British people. Um, it succeeded in doing in Australia, but it's not going to do it for most of the world. Most of the world either is not willing or can't, in the case of countries in the global south, afford to give up the advantages in speed of delivery and efficiency and cost, which Huawei gives to them. That means you're not gonna cut uh, Huawei out of developing Asia. You're not gonna cut it out of the Middle East. You're not gonna cut it out of Russia. You're not gonna cut, cut it out of Africa. It will continue to be the world's most efficient telecommunications company, right? Okay. The reason that Huawei is attacked, being attacked is because it's defeated the US and Western companies in fair competition. And it's therefore the United States, to, to, just to conclude, to embark upon what was very wittily and correctly put by somebody in a recent um, conversation. It's embarked, bar, bar, the US has embarked on what can be called the Tonya Harding tactic. For those who remember, Tonya Harding was a skater who couldn't defeat her rival, uh, Nancy Kerrigan, escape for, for in in competitions 
So her team decided to arrange a physical attack on Nancy Kerrigan on the grounds that if Tonya Harding couldn't be improved, Nancy Kerrigan could be damaged. That is what the United States is doing, and it is imposing a price, not many on the people of the company of uh, China, but also on people throughout the world. So these, these are the real forces and realities which lie behind what is a self-evident frame-up. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, John. That was great and uh, most informative. Um, our next speaker is uh, William Gingwe Dare. Um, William is a documentary filmmaker and author of Being Chinese in Canada, The Struggle for Identity, Redress and Belonging, published by Douglas and McIntyre in 2019. Um, it was also the winner of the 2020 Blue Metropolis uh, 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 Diversity Prize of Montreal. He has been an anti-imperialist campaigner, leading activist in, uh, in the two decade old movement for redress for the, for the Chinese Head Tax and Exclusion Act. William's grandfather arrived in Canada in 1909 and paid the $500 head tax back then. Uh, William's father also paid the same head tax when he came to Canada at the age of 14 in 1921. The Chinese Exclusion Act separated William's family for over three decades. His film, Moving the Mountain, documents how the two Sinophobic legislations affected his family and the Chinese Canadian community. William was trained as a professional engineer with a master's in mechanical engineering. In the fine tradition of Chinese Canadians, he has worked for the railways until his retirement. Um, after that, th that was when he wrote his award-winning book. And William has some very amazing reflections for us today. William, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. To start, as an immigrant settler, I acknowledge I'm on unceded indigenous lands of the traditional territory of both the Kanikaaka and the Anishinaabeg peoples. First, I'd like to thank Ken Stone and the organizers for inviting me to speak this evening. Let me give a brief history of Sinophobia in Canada. The British drug lords waged two wars against China to push opium in 1839 and 1856. Britain seized Hong Kong and forced China to sign unequal treaties, which led to a century of humiliation. A dozen European colonial and imperial powers occupied China. The European powers incited psychological and cultural phobia among the population with the concept of the yellow peril to justify the racist exploitation of Asia and to instill fear and hatred against the Chinese. Chinese workers left their impoverished villages and came to Canada to build the Transcontinental Railroad. Once it was comp completed in 1885, efforts were immediately made to discourage Chinese immigration. The Canadian government passed the first Sinophobic legislation and imposed a head tax of up to $500 on each Chinese immigrant. The government was essentially saying, you gave us your labor, now give us your money. The second Sinophobic law was the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1923. For 62 years of Canada's history, 1885 to 1947, there was standing legislation against Chinese immigrants. I am saying this to show that anti-Chinese, anti-Asian racism is embedded in Canadian history long before Huawei or the racist assaults we are facing today during the pandemic. The present demonization of China to justify the Cold War by Western powers will lead to more anti-Chinese racism as the yellow peril meets the red menace. The hysteria against Huawei began 
when the Americans realized that US technology was falling behind China in the development of 5G. They trumped up the charges that Huawei poses a national security threat and engages in theft of intellectual property. At the July 2018 Five Eyes meeting in Nova Scotia, the five countries in the spy network coordinated their plan to attack Huawei. The Five Eyes is composed of the US, the UK, and the three white colonial powers from the Commonwealth, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Following that July meeting, Australia banned Huawei in August, then New Zealand in November, after the US produced a barrage of reports about the dangers of Chinese cyber attacks. The UK then banned Huawei at the end of November. Canada has not stated whether it will ban Huawei, but due to the uncertainty of the government delay, Canadian telecoms have contracted with Ericsson and Nokia. So effectively, Huawei is out of 5G development in Canada. Then on November, on December 1st, 2018, the Canadian government captured Huawei's CFO, Wang Wanzhou, at the request of the US for allegedly violating sanctions against Iran. Biden will continue Trump's belligerence towards China. It was the Obama-Biden-Clinton team that moved away from peaceful coexistence with China to treat China as the number one adversary with their pivot to Asia, China containment strategy in 2011. China came out of the 2008 financial crisis in relatively good shape, while the Western capitalist world was in a state of decline and deep recession. The West realized that the two decades of engagement and investment in China did not produce the results that they wanted, i.e. a more complaint compliant China with the possibility of regime change since they thought the internal contradictions of Chinese society would collapse the communist system. The Chinese, however, had their own game plan and their own system to deal with these internal contradictions, which brought 800 million people out of poverty in 40 years. So the American strategy is military encirclement around China. 60% of the US naval fleet is now stationed in the Asia Pacific. The US is increasing its military support to Taiwan, strengthening strategic cooperation with India, maintaining its military bases in South Korea, Japan, Philippines, and Afghanistan, amongst other countries. Canada, the Canadian naval frigates have also sailed through the Taiwan Strait, violating Chinese sovereignty. Canada is using the Cold War to justify its increased military spending, such as the $200 billion in building new frigates and buying new warplanes. China's primary response to the US strategy is to develop its high technology and economic infrastructure through projects such as clean energy to fight climate change, as well as in other high technology areas like 6G, which is 100 times faster and more powerful than 5G. This is where Huawei, ZTE, and other high tech developers come in for attack by the US and Canadian intelligence. More than this, Chinese President Xi Jinping is promoting what he calls a new community with a shared future for humanity. A new internationalism, if you will, is being nurtured to counter the military containment through economic development with projects like the New Silk Road, the Road and Belt Initiative, BRI. To date, more than 140 countries have signed on to the BRI. Through these projects, the global South can decolonize itself and move away from the centuries old paradigm 
of Western economic domination. All these developments scare the West. It's not just the fear of a, of a rise in China, but also the fear of their own decline. The demonization of China has serious, serious repercussions for the Asian diaspora living in the belly of the beast. As Japanese Canadians experienced with their internment during the Second World War, visible minorities can easily be targeted and scapegoated. That is why today I stand in solidarity with religious minorities in Quebec to fight the racist Bill 21 that was passed in 2019. This law forbids people wearing religious symbols like the hijab, the turban, or the yarmulke from working in the civil service and as teachers. We learn through our experience of the head tax and Chinese Exclusion Act that legislation targeting and excluding a particular minority will make society less tolerant and less accepting of people that are different from the majority. The case against Hmong and Huawei plays into the overall Sinophobic sentiments in Canada. These Sinophobic ideas are fermented by the media through the vilification of China on issues such as Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, and the Chinese response to COVID-19. Huawei and Meng Wanzhou are caught in this web of anti-China narrative. This is also reflected in how Chinese Canadians are being treated during the pandemic. Asian anti-Asian hate crimes reported to the Vancouver police increased by a whopping 717% in 2020. Research by the Chinese Canadian National Council last year shows at least 600 cases of anti-Asian incidents across Canada. The report reveals that 83% of the racist attacks were directed against East Asians, 7% at Southeast Asians, 2% at South Asians, and not surprisingly, 1% at Indigenous peoples. In Montreal, Inuit people have been verbally assaulted and told to go back to China. The MP, Derek Sloan, even questioned the loyalty of Canada's chief medical officer, Dr. Teresa Tang, and asked whether she works for Canada or for China. So the Canadian mainstream media has become the main propaganda tool against China. CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, was a participant in the 2018 Five Eyes meeting to target Huawei. It feeds the media stories about the Chinese threat, focusing on Chinese Canadian community leaders and politicians as agents of the Communist Party of China. Loaded words like covert infiltration are used to allege Chinese secret agents operating in Canadian politics, social media, and academia. In November 2020, all opposition parties, including the NDP, the Green, and the Bloc Québécois, supported a conservative motion calling on the government to ban Huawei and, I quote, to combat China's growing foreign operations here in Canada and its increasing intimidation of Canadians, unquote. 2020 was a banner year of, for misinformation to a general public already numb by anti-China rhetoric. What the media say is now accepted as the natural narrative in order to condition the population for anti-China actions such as boycotting the 2022 Beijing Olympics and the push for sanctions against China. The so-called infiltration of Canadian society by China sympathizers, a term which could apply to some of us here tonight, is leading to possible government intervention as the logical outcome of anti-China propaganda. The demonization of China could have troubling implications for Chinese Canadians, such as government surveillance and racist attacks. Thanks to the organizers of tonight's panel discussion, the Canadian people are starting to question their own government's participation in this Cold War, which could easily lead to a hot war. 
we, we must work together in solidarity to counter the hate and fear that is being propagated daily in the mainstream media, not just against China, but also against all those who speak up for peace and international cooperation. As someone from the Chinese Canadian community, I feel we need the support of the wider society to overcome any xenophobic efforts by the government. Hopefully as a result of tonight's meeting, we can unite and go forward to build a long-term peace movement against the Cold War and against xenophobia. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. That was really great. Um, our final speaker tonight is Justin Podur. Justin is a professor um, at York University at the Faculty of Environment and Urban Change. Um, he is the author of some really interesting books. One of them is America's Wars on Democracy in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. That was That is his most recent work. It came out this past year. And uh, uh, Haiti's New Dictatorship, published in 2012. He has also contributed to important collections, um, writing about imperialism, such as Empire's Ally, Canada's War in Afghanistan, which came out in 2013, and Real Utopia, which came out in Winnipeg's own Arbiter Ring Press in 2008. Um, he also writes fiction. Justin has the author of three novels, The Path of the Unarmed, Siege Breakers, and The Demands of the Dead. He's a fellow of the Indian, uh, 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 sorry, of the Indian, of the Independent Media Institute's Globe Trotter Project. He has uh, previously reported from India, that specifically Kashmir and Chhattisgarh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Haiti, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Colombia, Venezuela, Mexico, specifically Chiapas and Israel-Palestine for a number of uh, important critical news organizations such as ZNet, Telesol, Rabble.ca, Ricochet, and others. So I'm very pleased to uh, ask uh, uh, Justin to bring our uh, session to its culmination. Justin, go ahead. Thank you so much, Radhika. And uh, yeah, thank you to everyone here uh, today. Thank you to the organizers, um, what I've been calling the little anti-war coalitions. I have to say coalitions now, don't I? coalition that could when I at first I was, it really was only Hamilton I think that that was uh, working towards trying to free Meng Wanzhou and uh, yeah I mean you know what William said just now it's it's striking to me like while we are allowed to speak <laughs> for as long as we're allowed to speak I think we have to we have to do it um, you know since uh, since England <laughs> su suppressed uh, sympathetic uh, expression toward the French Revolution and the uh, at the end of the 18th century, our Western civilization has always had some amb ambivalence about allowing dissent. Um, but like I said, we have to uh, we have to try. Um, uh, it, it, I I really appreciate what the previous panelists said because what I'm going to talk about really complements um, the economic and the domestic uh, anti-Asian racism um, aspects that uh, John and William have covered. Uh, there are a few things that I'm not gonna talk about that I think are worth pointing to if you want to look into this a little further. Um, I, it's worth studying the Hassan Diab case um, that's going on. This is a, a professor uh, from Ottawa who was uh, extradited to France, uh, faced a whole nightmare of being jailed. Uh, he was under house arrest here for a long time. Uh, the French investigators ultimately decided uh, there was not enough evidence to proceed. He was freed. He's now uh, been, he's now back under threat, under appeal. And his lawyers have argued that Canada's extradition system is fundamentally broken. Um, the things that he is the the things that he's accused of doing, uh, he could not have done, um, and the evidence that was used to uh, accuse him in France would not be accepted in a Canadian court. Nonetheless, uh, Canada has extradited him once, and he's under threat of being extradited again. I say this just because. Um, 
this is one element of the Canadian system, one of many, that is playing into this uh, issue. Um, Canada feels the need to give France whatever it wants, give the U.S. whatever it wants when it comes to handing people over uh, to systems that don't even that don't share um, the ability to mount a defense that exists here in Canada. Um, there's a coalition in Ottawa working on this, in case you want to follow this. Um, there, the four notes that I want to touch on in the next few minutes. Uh, first, the kind of discourse reasons why China is being demonized in Canada. Um, second, the kind of imperial hangover that's leading to a lot of this racism um, that's creating this enabling environment for what's happening in Meng Wanzhou's case. Um, related to that, Canada's history of colonialism, which could we could talk about for much longer than a couple of minutes, but I'll give you some points to think about when you're when you're assessing the credibility of uh, the Canadian Parliament in accusing leveling accusations of genocide, for example. And finally, the kind of imperialist fantasies about China, again, that create an enabling environment. So, the dis the discourse reasons, as I've termed it, um, Canada has failed to deal with COVID-19. Um, Canada, as Linda McQuaig uh, has written about and others, privatized uh, a really uh, effective vaccine production company some decades ago. Uh, we um, are structurally unable, it seems, to learn from China. There was an article uh, by Matthew Raza in Salon just yesterday titled, China eradicated COVID-19 within months. Why won't America learn from them? And that question could easily uh, apply to Canada as well. Um, we have uh, a, a healthcare system that is the envy of the United States, but our elder care system is private and for-profit. And it is where 80% of COVID deaths have occurred. Um, 2,877 plus deaths in Ontario, 3,890 deaths in Quebec, uh, long-term care facilities at the time that this paper was published that I'm citing from The Lancet. So that's more people that have died in long-term facil care facilities in Canada than have died in all of China in the pandemic. Um, China, as William mentioned, has eliminated poverty in our time. That's one of the most remarkable achievements in human history. But we can't talk about any of this because if you mention any of this, it'll, it's instantly the reply is, well, you know, China's imperialist or something, you know, Xinjiang genocide. Um, these kinds of claims are used to silence even chances where we could learn something from another society. Um, so, uh, which is even, there's an even stranger element to this that I'm going to get back to, which is uh, it, Canada does rely on um, Chinese, the Chinese economy for a, a lot of things. China, Chinese, I mean, Canadian universities are trying to recruit increasing numbers of Chinese students. As foreign students, they pay foreign student fees they're an increasing part of the um, public universities business model um, as the public universities decide we're not going to rely on public funding, we're going to rely on foreign students. So it's like a qu quite a message that we're sending to Chinese students, right? Um, you're genocidal, you're evil, uh, come study with us and pay foreign student fees, please. Um, bail out our public universities. Um, but this is uh, related to the imperial hangover because um, the idea, Canada has a long connection with China through the British Empire. Um, if you look at the careers of, for example, Garnet Wolseley, who was the military commander who was sent in 1870 to suppress Louis Riel's resistance to the encroachment of Canada. Or you look at the career of Lord Elgin, 
um, who was the governor of British North America, the governor general, who granted um, Canada responsible government in the 1840s. Well, these two figures uh, were both present at the burning of the Chinese uh, summer palace in Beijing during the Second Opium War. Um, and if you look, I, I've just been researching these, uh, these, this period of Chinese and Indian history and British imperialism. The numbers are absolutely staggering for what happened. You know, the 1857 war in India, some estimates are that 10 million people in India were killed uh, by British imp imperial campaigns in the aftermath of that. The, op the Second Opium War occurred during the Taiping Rebellion, which had everything to do with imperial encroachments and which people think killed maybe 20 million people. Um, there were famines in India and China in 1876 and 1896 that killed more tens of millions. Um, Mike Davis wrote about these and called them the late Victorian Holocausts, not for nothing. Um, it may have been one fifth uh, one eighth of the populations of the most populous countries in the world. And, you know, this is grim and gory and gruesome, but the point is that this was the time that Canada was also establishing its current territorial extent. Um, it was encroaching on indigenous land starting after uh, Confederation, accelerating after Confe Confederation. Um, and this was the time when all kinds of complex manipulations of commodities and the gold standard and finance um, and markets were all being manipulated for the maximum benefit of imperialism. And there's an analogous financial system today that has to do with the US dollar and sanctions and the military bases and the military campaigns. And again, this would take a long time to unspool, but it's well worth um, studying uh, and understanding if you want to understand the real causes, as you know, um, our previous speakers have said, of this new Cold War that we find ourselves in. So, I just as I as you go through Canadian history in this period, some of the some there are some amazing things that that jump out. Um, some of the things that right now Canada is accusing China of doing are almost exactly things that we have documented historical evidence that Canada ha did to First Nations in the course of its expansion. Um, there, you know, in addition to banning cultural ceremonies, right, such as the potlatch, uh, forbidding people to move freely through past laws, forbidding the use of the, their home languages, indigenous languages, the kidnapping of women and girls to force them to accept whiskey trading, for example. Um, the, when, when, when Canada imposed a kind of a famine on Western indigenous nations, um, and Sir John A. Macdonald, who is still on our money um, and whose statues still continue to adorn many campuses in other parts of Canada, um, when the liberals criticized him for spending too much on famine relief for Indigenous nations. And he reassured the, li the liberals and he said, listen, we are doing all we can by refusing food until the Indians are on the verge of starvation to reduce the expense. Um, there, was, there have been accusations that uh, people in Xinjiang being Muslims have been forced to eat pork. Um, it just struck me as a very dramatic story in Canadian history that in the, during the 1880s famine, one of the indigenous uh, nations, Chief Piapo's band, they were, they did work for the food ration and they were given poisoned, rancid pork. One of their leaders complained that it was inevitable. I mean, it was inedible. And the Indian agent said the Indians should eat the bacon or die and be damned to them. Uh, 130 people died after eating this. 
um, sexual sterilization, the Sexual Sterilization Act of Alberta, under which thousands of Indigenous women were sterilized between 1928 and 1972. Um, the destruction of data and evidence. Um, you know, there was a whistleblower named Peter Bryce who wrote a book called The Story of a National Crime, being a record of the health conditions of the Indians of Canada from 1904 to 1921. Um, so there have been cover-ups of this data. Uh, William mentioned the, the Exclusion Act um, in 18, the Electoral Franchise Act that took the franchise away from Asian Canadians. Uh, when, when this happened, Sir John A. Macdonald, uh, he said in Parliament, the Aryan races will not wholesomely amalgamate with the Africans or the Asiatics. The cross of those races, like the cross of the dog and the fox, is not successful. Um, same guy said in the same year, we must vindicate the position of the white man. We must teach the Indians what law is. Uh, in the 1920s, um, there were bans on political organizing and the employment of lawyers. So you might make an obvious defense of Canada by saying, well, that was then, right? And this is now. So the question that arises then is what is being done to return what was stolen by these means? The recommendations on missing and murdered Indigenous women, the TRCA, the, the Reconciliation Commission, the TRC, yeah, the TRC, Indigenous languages, um, drinking water, 30% of First Nations water systems are at high risk for contamination, one in eight communities at any given time. And the government, the Canadian government, is spending hundreds of millions fighting um, against Indigenous land claims in court, using injunctions to build mines. Uh, there are vigilantes committing violence against Indigenous people exercising their inherent right to fish, for example, on the East Coast, happened during the pandemic. So um, the last thought I want to leave you with is um, you might think that all of this Five Eyes stuff and these cases and this kind of hatred that's being stirred up against Chinese people and against China is about excluding China, right? It's like, there's a, there's a kind of an idea like we have to keep Huawei off our networks or we have to exclude China, but it isn't really about exclusion. Even if you go back to the Vancouver riots uh, on the West Coast, you know, about a hundred years ago, that was not about exclusion. It's much more a, a technique of control. Um, and the, you know, the imperial drive is to control everything that happens in the world. Um, and if China could just exercise its innovations um, in the service of the empire, um, then they could be given a subordinate position um, in that world order. But the, the panic uh, that imperialists are feeling, I think, has to do with the possibility that China is returning to its histor long historical position of being about 25% of the world economy. Um, and, you know, Canada could really gracefully uh, accept this change by working towards things like truth and reconciliation, land back, you know, returning the land to indigenous people, adjusting to a post-imperialist world. I think that um, Canadians are interested in this kind of a world, um, but our elites are very much not. Um, and so that's the, uh, that's the task that we have before us, I would say. Um, and yeah, I, again, I appreciate everybody who's here for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. That was so well put and a wonderful um, conclusion to the presentations of the event. And now we will move towards um, the discussion. Uh, just to remind you, the chat is now open for people who want to submit their questions. So please do so. Uh, several people I know have already emailed Brendan a whole host of questions. In the question and answer session, we will proceed as follows. First, we have a small number of media questions, so we will put those first. 
Then uh, we will go to the question. Oh, then, then we have a small message from a sponsor. And then we will go to the question and answer. Um, uh, I, I believe, uh, but uh, Greta, please correct me if I'm wrong, but everybody who wishes to, to say anything or, or make a comment or a question, please put it in the chat. I don't believe we are taking questions from people who want to raise hands. Um, <clears throat> please also note that uh, uh, you, we expect everyone to maintain uh, a reasonable civility and decorum in the chat as well. We will not be tolerating any racist, sexist, or homophobic remarks, please be respectful of the panelists, of the participants, and of the event. Okay, having said that, I will for now go to the first of the media questions. I have Daniel Shea from Canada Files. Is Daniel here? If so, please. Yes, uh, I'm here. Okay, please go ahead and pose your question. So this, I, I, this was a really good presentation and I particularly loved how you guys all framed it in the rise of China and uh, in the <clears throat> with regards to the rise of China and the efforts by the US and Canada to suppress the rising power of China and maintain their own imperial hegemony. My question is, it seems like the issue of China has been a rather quite partisan since not just liberals or conservatives but an all all out quad partisan effort to stir up tensions with china like you have the greens and the ndp voting voting on bills spreading anti-china narratives about xinjiang and voting on bills about huawei while the leader of the greens are it's unironically trying to make canada the the host of the next Olympics just to spite China, I think. So I'm wondering, like, with the quad partisan total unity against China, what can we Canadians do with regards to opposing the narratives coming from our government or our political elites to march in lockstep with the US in this new Cold War? Cold War, this Cold War. Cold War, along with their willful complicity in fanning Sinophobic and anti-Chinese narratives. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I, I will get all the three media questions and then go to the panelists. I should have said one other thing. Uh, when we get to the questions, we will be prioritizing questions for John Ross first, because some of you may not know this, but he is in England, where at the moment it is just past 1 a.m. at night. So uh, we will try and let him go sooner than, uh, than the rest of our events. So I hope that will be okay. All right. So our next media question is from Serge uh, Ruski uh, from Sputnik. Please go ahead, Serge. Uh, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to all the panelists uh, for taking the time to participate in this event. Uh, my question is actually for Mr. Ross. Uh, Canada is the last Five Eyes partner not to ban Huawei uh, exp uh, ex uh, explicitly. Uh, how closely is Canada's decision being followed in China? And more broadly, in the new millennium, the Canadian economy has heavily relied on Chinese investment. Uh, what are the in, what are the implications for the Canadian economy? Not only just if Huawei is banned, but if the ongoing confrontation endures or worsens. Thank you. Okay, great, Serge. And finally, I have Dimitri. I I wonder if Dimitri has made it here. And uh, Dimitri, if you're here, please go ahead. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Great. Uh, so my question is for all the panelists, uh, and it's a broad question, a big question, and so I don't want to, I, I'm cognizant of the fact you couldn't possibly do it, uh, complete justice in the space of uh, a couple of minutes, but I'm interested in general sense, you know, there's a broad recognition uh, on the left that there is a new Cold War in the offing, uh, the principal target of which is China. We know that we understand broadly on the left that there is um, the motivation for this Cold War is that the United States is finally confronted for the first time since the fall of the Soviet Union by a rival in terms of economic power, political influence, and potentially even 
uh, military capability at some point down the road. Uh, and that's what's really motivating this. We broadly recognize that the United States government isn't remotely concerned about human rights, but where there is oftentimes uh, disagreement on the left in this country is just what the real human rights reality is in China. I'm curious in general terms, what your thought about that is. Do you, do you view the Chinese government as being uh, largely respectful of the human rights of its own citizens? Uh, or do you think that there are some real issues in terms of uh, human rights compliance uh, within China by the government? Thank you very much, Dimitri. So now we will go to the panel and I will, um, these are all very, very substantial questions, but I will try, I will request the panelists to please try and confine themselves to about three minutes each, although, yeah, it's a little flexible. So please go ahead. I think we'll go in the same order as the speak of speaking. So John first and then uh, William and then Justin. Uh, John, please unmute yourself. That's what I'm yeah. doing. Okay, if first don't worry, it's one o'clock. It doesn't make a big difference whether I go to bed at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right, okay. Um, on the questions, right. Firstly, how much is the situation in, in uh, Canada followed in China? Extremely closely. You have to understand that the Chinese public is hugely better informed on international affairs then I, I know in the most extreme way, the US public or the um, British public, I, I, I apologize, I do, I do not know as Canada as well as I do the United States or Britain, but uh, it is enormous. I mean, it's like, you know, 10 times, the Chinese public is 10 times as well as informed about uh, events in the United States or the events in the West as the West is about events in China. So what Canada does, does is followed very closely in China. And the response is very simple. What, what, is, what does Canada want to do? Um, there was an attempt um, earlier to make a what, what China would call a win-win relationship, mutually beneficial relationship between Canada and China, and which is um, could be very beneficial. Um, China is uh, has a shortage of energy. Uh, China is technologically below the levels of Canada. On the other hand, the China is an unequal supplier of what you might call medium technology and low high-end technology consumer goods. It can produce them more efficiently than anybody else in the world. And therefore that's the basis for a um, win-win situation. However, Canada instead seems to be intent upon pursuing a course as exemplified around this case of uh, Ms. Mung uh, of are being uh, subordinate to the United States on purely political grounds. And therefore Canada will follow in a very objective way. If, the, if Canada intends to pursue a policy which is subordinate to the United States, that is putting its political Cold War considerations have economic, then China will not really wanna do very much business with China, with Canada, why should it? If on the other hand, Canada wants to re return to normally beneficial Relation, mutually beneficial relations with um, with uh, chi with uh, China, then the, the China is very interested in this matter. That's the first thing. Right, okay. On the question of human rights, let me state this in a very blunt way. China has made the greatest contribution to the development of human rights of any country in the world. You have to understand what does it mean to lift by World Bank standards, 853 million people out of poverty since 1981. That is, uh, that is more than twice, two and a half times the population in the United States, more than, two and, more than two and a half times the population in the United States and Canada combined, more than the population of the Latin American continent, more than the entire population of the European Union. This by itself, would be the biggest contribution to the human rights in the world. Because what is put forward as the Western concept of human rights is absolute nonsense. To measure the question of whether you have human rights by whether you have a Facebook, you can use Facebook or not, or you can use Twitter, this is nonsense. There is no person in the world who is living in poverty. And don't forget how low the standard of poverty is 
by the World Bank definition. It is one expenditure of $1.90 per day. That is really immense poverty. Nobody who is living at that standard has any freedom, any human rights, any right to decide what they're doing in the world. This therefore is that, that I'll put that very, very bluntly. China has also got the biggest, most rapid increase in average living standards of any country in the world. If you look at it in terms of that, real terms, China has made the biggest contribution to human rights of any country in the world, and it's only the absurd definitions given of human rights in the West which obscure this fact. What, of course, it doesn't make any difference to is the situation in China. Please don't feel isolated or worried in Canada or Britain or the United States. At the moment, the Chinese people, are, yeah, I'm in contact. By chance, I was outside China when COVID, COVID um, struck. So I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the same regulations as all foreigners. I can't enter China at the present time because for very logical reasons, they want to keep the, the risk of disease out, of COVID out, having basically conquered it within China. The Chinese people are feeling incredibly confident at this moment. They have firstly crushed COVID-19 and they look with horror at what is happening in the West on this. Secondly, as a result of that, their economy is the only major economy in the world in, in 2020 which grew. And I would say from the point of the confidence of the Chinese people, and don't forget that's almost one in every five people in humanity, rarely has it been at a greater point of confidence than it is at the present time, because they're not interested, quite rightly, in all this nonsense which is going on, these fake things about the non-existent genocide in Xinjiang, when the, pop the Uyghur population of Xinjiang has been growing more rapidly than the Han population of Xinjiang. This is the only genocide in the world, so-called genocide in the world, in which the people who are supposed to be the victims of the genocide are increasing at a more rapid rate in population than the people who are alleged to do the genocide. I don't believe that under Hitler, the Jews in Germany spread and increased their numbers more than the German population. Uh, they know that the situation in, non in Hong Kong is nonsense. What you have in, Ho in Hong Kong is these rioters, or they are anti-xenophobic, anti-Chinese people who attack people on the streets of Hong Kong for speaking a Mandarin. That is the language of mainland China. The best analogy for these is the white racist mobs in the uh, south of the United States. And the people of China never, in all the time I've been there, have felt so confident as what they're, that they are pursuing the right course as, as they do at the present time. So don't, this is a very much bigger population than the population of North America or Europe. So don't feel you're isolated. And also, also I know that the impact of what China is doing in what is called the global South, that is the 6 billion people in the, in the world, the, the influence of China and its success is spreading there. What you have of the people who are spreading this nonsense about China is a relatively small group of white imperialist racist countries. So I like the people who came here tonight, don't feel isolated in the world. You're in the big majority of the world population. Thanks very much, John. Um, William. Uh, yes. Um... Those are very heavy questions, and I think it it would deal with uh, with the existential issues that we'll be facing over the next generation or so. I think why the West fears China or hates China is because China offers an alternative to the existing order that the West has been lording over, over the last 150, 200 years. So the world is changing and the West is holding on as much as possible, as long as possible to avoid this change. And as John just mentioned, the 6 billion people of the global South is fighting 
against colonialism. It's trying to decolonize 150, 200 years of colonialism. And so naturally, which way would they lean? They would lean to an anti-imperialist power rather than to an imperialist power. And so that briefly is why the West hates China so much. Now, the next question is, why does the Western left hate China? Now that's a little bit more complicated to answer because when you're left washing everything, such as genocide, uh, Hong Kong protests, uh, when you give a left cover to these things, and on top of that, you bring up the issue of human rights. Because Chinese civilization is what, two, 3,000 years? And so you don't get through two, 3,000 years if the rights of the people are not respected. So, so before you go into a, uh, into a, I wouldn't say sinophobic, but get into a holier than thou uh, pronouncement on the question of human rights in China today, do some research rather than accepting what you are being fed. The Ash Center of Harvard University did a 13 year survey of, 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 of Chinese people from 2003 to 2016. And they found that over 90% of the Chinese people view the government favorably or fairly favorably uh, over that period of time. And, yet, and you have the Edelman Trust Index, which finds that about 88% of the Chinese people trust their government. Whereas I think they had about 35, 40% that trust the American government and 35, 40% that view the American government favorably. So, so, so on, on the question of human rights, I mean, who are we in the West impose our definition and our criteria of human rights onto another people when we're not even there? But of course you can say, well, human rights is universal. You know, a, a person has to have the right of freedom to express themselves and so on and so forth. Of course, the Chinese people have freedom to express themselves. I go back to China every couple of years because my, my, my wife's family still live there. And my father-in-law is still alive, uh, who was a uh, revolutionary and anti-Japanese uh, uh, resistance fighter. And to them, they have so much freedom today than what they had, say, a generation ago. And Xi Jinping, you know, I'm not quoting Xi like I'm quoting Chairman Mao. I would quote Chairman Mao very easily. But Xi Jinping said before he became uh, the president of China, he said, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing that China has done for humanity is to keep 1.4 billion people from starvation. Imagine that. When you keep 1.4 billion people from starvation, you are giving them their basic human right of survival. So when the, when the left, the Greens and the NDP and, and these people talk about the uh, human rights and genocide in Xinjiang. I asked him, why the hell are you not doing something in parliament against, you know, against the government or, or push the government to respect the human rights of the indigenous people here in Canada? Justin gave us all these statistics and all these human rights violations of the indigenous people here in Canada, and yet they're useless. The NDP, the Green Party, all these people are totally useless. They have not been able to do anything for the indigenous people here in Canada. And yet they project this violation of human rights against indigenous people here in Canada onto China because it's so easy for them to put up their hand and say that China is 
violating the human rights of people. This is nonsense. And I think I better stop here because I'm getting my blood pressure up. Thank you, William. We wouldn't have known that. Um, <laughs> uh, you're very staid. Uh, Justin, please go ahead. I mean, uh, I really appreciate what John and William have said. Um, I can only add, I wrote an article about human rights uh, a couple of years ago. It was called the human rights organizations are part of the problem. And I read this book by James Peck called Ideal Illusions, how the US government co-opted human rights. So if you're using this word, human rights, it's really important to go back and figure out where this came from, where this dialogue, where this, where this trope came from. And the idea is this, the USSR, the Soviet Union, the communists were um, really appealing to Africa, to Latin America, to other countries in Asia on grounds of, any, uh, on grounds of equality, on grounds of universal um, principles, on grounds that, you know, genuinely that people are human beings and human beings are entitled to uh, certain rights. I mean, that's what Marxism is sort of about. Um, it's a truly universal approach to humanity, um, as opposed to racial, uh, racially divided hierarchies, which the West, including Canada, the US, Britain, were always about. And so the US was looking for some kind of ideological basis uh, to fight this. And it's one thing to say, well, anti we're anti-communist. But anti-communism is a negative ideology. It's not quite as appealing as a positive ideology. So they said, okay, let's go for human rights and democracy. And so this human rights and democracy kind of discourse is born. So they start calling Western allies free, communist countries, totalitarian, authoritarian, whatever. Um, and it's based on, you know, a few things. Do you have two parties or one? Do you have, um, you know, some kind of several newspapers or just one? Uh, do you have the chance to pick between these two parties or not? There's no issue of social rights or economic rights or um, really freedom of expression in terms of your ability to criticize the regime or the economic system. Uh, because countries are labeled as, the, even today, right? One frustration that I have is Venezuela is simply just called an authoritarian dictatorship, whatever, whatever they want to call it. It has elections. It has multiple parties. It has a free press that is so dramatically against the government in power that, you know, it would make your head spin to hear some of the things they say about, you know, like Aaron O'Toole pointing to a toilet and saying this is where Justin Trudeau should be. That's nothing compared to what the private media talks about with Venezuela, okay? Um, so, uh, but Venezuela is somehow called authoritarian. So when, when someone is saying, what about human rights? What about, you know, the fact that China is not a democracy? I mean, a democracy is the people rule. It's not a representative system where there are billionaires who fund politicians and political parties to, um, you know, you select there these elaborate uh, processes to select candidates. We have a multi-party oligarchy here. I don't know how, you know, I don't think it makes a lot of sense in political science terms to call this a democracy. So, um, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there, just in terms of the history and provenance of the human rights question. I think it would be very interesting to people to look that up and see what that's really about and where that comes from. Okay, great. Thanks, Justin. Now, I would like to take a, a very short break and ask Miguel from the Canadian Peace Congress to make a, an announcement. Miguel, are you here? Miguel Figueroa. Yes, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Right. Well, thanks, uh, Radhika, and uh, much thanks to the organizers of this webinar, and of course to, to our panelists who gave some 
really fantastic presentations today. On behalf of the Canadian Peace Congress, um, I'd like to share with you uh, three observations that we feel uh, are particularly important at this moment. Of course, our speakers have, have alluded to them uh, in whole or in part uh, during their presentations, but we think it's important to underline them. The first one uh, is, of course, that the campaign uh, to free uh, Meng Wanzhou uh, must continue. It must uh, broaden uh, and it must uh, grow. There should be no let up in terms of that, uh, notwithstanding what uh, Justin Trudeau or anybody else says that it's a, a fait accompli and that there, there won't be uh, um, uh, the possibility of, of winning her freedom. Um, but at the same time, it's important to remember that uh, it shouldn't be treated in isolation. And of course, our speakers have already referred to this. Uh, it's one theater uh, of, of uh, action or one theater of struggle uh, in a very wide, all-sided uh, and uh, highly coordinated uh, Cold War against, uh, against China to essentially demonize everything that, that the PRC does um, and, and of course to demonize its government in the first place, to suggest that it's a threat to the national security of, of the Western imperialist states, that it, it harbors plans for aggression against its neighbors uh, in uh, Asia and the Pacific, uh, and of course commits heinous crimes and even genocide against its own uh, peoples. And of course, they're not bound by facts or concrete evidence to make this. Uh, they just keep repeating this narrative over and over and over again uh, while blocking any alternative uh, narrative or dissenting opinions. Um, in, in fact, it's like the big lie that uh, Joseph Goebbels uh, would uh, no doubt uh, nod in approval. Uh, the second point is that there shouldn't be any underestimation about how dangerous this situation is. I mean, um, um, yes, uh, they are using the same tools of hybrid warfare uh, that we've seen against Syria and Venezuela, and Nicaragua and many other countries, um, military encirclement, um, economic pressures and sanctions, um, in info war and prop massive propaganda, uh, cyber, cyber warfare and so on. But there's a qualitative difference, we think, with respect to China. And that is in the other cases, um, at least part of their strategy is to foment regime change from within, to develop opposition forces and so on, uh, to uh, destabilize governments and, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, but that won't work. And, and the imperialist circles know that with respect to China. Uh, William has already referred, uh, to, and John has referred to the fact that uh, uh, the Chinese government has very broad support amongst the Chinese people for a number of reasons, because of the economic successes, because of increasing um, living standards, because of the uh, incredible efforts to uh, alleviate uh, poverty and particularly to eradicate extreme poverty. And of course, they're dealing, they're handling of the pandemic. Um, and so for that reason, their strategy is basically to impose regime change from without. Part of that's economic sanctions and uh, political and diplomatic isolation but really the main weapon that they have are preparations for war. And in fact, that we think is a very serious danger that, that shouldn't be underestimated. And they're moving very quickly, they're fast tracking efforts to not only encircle China with the existing naval forces and so on, but to put new medium range and intermediate range land-based launchers on a whole number of territories and islands uh, surrounding China and so on. Um, and of course, we know that should that unfold, it won't be kept within the borders of China. A war won't be restricted to the uh, Pacific and the uh, East Asia. Uh, it will very quick, quickly escalate to global dimensions. Um, and the possibility of thermonuclear war is a very real possibility. Finally, just to say that... Uh, Miguel, can you turn your... Uh, your um, voice up a little, your volume oh, up a I, little. I, I don't know that I can, but uh, okay. I'll try and speak a little bit more closely. Louder, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, finally, with respect to the peace movement and the challenges that it faces, I think the experiences of the most recent period with respect to the Biden administration and its pronouncements on China since coming into uh, 
uh, into office. And the shameless, or shameful actually, uh, and slavish spectacle that we saw unfold in Parliament last week with all of the parliamentary parties jumping on the bandwagon and whipping up uh, um, you know, this um, Cold War and this war hysteria. Um, this should remind us that any hope or reliance on governments to change course or appealing to uh, political parties to change course um, is an illusion. And that we really need to concentrate on building up the grassroots extra parliamentary uh, forces for peace um, to, to counter this, these, these the drums of war that are increasing daily. Um, and it's gonna be difficult because of the mass media and also because of social media. There will be increasing pressures, uh, particularly from the big platforms, the, the ones that are controlled by big monopolies, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram and so on, to, to, uh, to try to silence uh, any kind of dissent. But regardless, we have to build up, we have to use every possibility, and we have to be courageous in speaking out against this danger. We cannot afford to, to duck and hope that somehow this danger will pass, because uh, if we do so, it will be too late. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Um... I just want to say that we are short of time in the following sense. Uh, I'm going to be uh, supposed to end at uh, 8.50 or 9.50 as it will be for, yeah, 8.50 in uh, Eastern, Eastern time. I have many batches of questions. Uh, so I'm going to uh, read them fairly quickly and give, every, uh, give the speakers, a, 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 you know, two or three minutes each to respond. Please don't feel compelled to respond to all of them. And I think some of these may already have been answered. But here goes the next batch of questions. Um, so uh, this is from the audience now. So question from Nahid for John. Uh, why is Huawei considered a security threat? Is there a secret access that Huawei can use to hack the system? Question for David, also from David, also for John Ross. Um, uh, 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 he wants to ask about the structure of Huawei. Uh, I was told he says that it is actually a cooperative, the most profitable one in the world and one of the largest. A third question from Henry for all, this, all the panelists. Why is the NDP marching lockstep to the current lies being espoused by the conservatives? John, you can answer this in relation to British labor if you want. Fourthly, uh, what are the legal basis? Uh, looking at the legal basis, how are the forces being played out in China? That's not a very clear question to me, but if you can make any sense of it, please go ahead and respond. Finally, question from Ed. I'm wondering whether we have any idea how many jobs and how much income has been lost in Canada due to Canada's worsening relationship with China. Thank you. So brief responses, and then we'll go to the second batch. I think beginning this time with Justin, and then William, and then John. Uh, Justin, are you muted? Yeah, I was. I was in the classic Zoom. What's what's the more what's the most th thing ever said on Zoom, right? You're muted. muted. You're muted. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can, um, I'm not sure how, what to make uh, of the questions. Um, I, I, this might be the last thing I say, right, Radhika? Uh, no, there are a couple more batches. We're going to go till at least 8.50. The point is, sorry, the, uh, at that point, at 9 o'clock, the interpreters must leave. So if mm. we elect to continue beyond that, we will be losing people who need interpreters. Let me cede my space. I know John said he doesn't care whether it's one or two, but um, you know, freshness and, and energy are also a thing. Do, do you want to? Do you want to sure. go ahead? All right. Then uh, I will take go to John. Uh, sorry, William, and then John. Okay, and actually, maybe I'll I'll yield my time to John as well because. I was, I was typing an answer to Dimitri, so I didn't catch any of your questions. Oh dear, okay. Uh, John, you have all the questions to yourself. Right, okay, well, it, it's, it really doesn't make much difference. 1 a.m. or uh, 2, 2 a.m., my advanced age, I'm, I, I normally go to bed about 10 o'clock. So, <laughs> so, 
so it's indifferent to me. But anyway, right, to deal with these things. Right. Firstly, on the question of the security threat, this is complete nonsense. It's the biggest thing which, which be, I've been saying on this matter for, you know, 12 years, which is, I, I actually don't object to security services checking up the security of telecommunications equipment. I mean, as, there's lots of things that the security services of the United States or Britain do, which I would take strong exception to. But I think this is a very reasonable thing to do. And they found nothing, zero, in uh, on the question of Huawei. This is the clearest demonstration. This is completely fake. It only needs one single case of an authenticated backdoor into a Huawei system to destroy the company or incidentally any other company in the world. They haven't found any, despite the fact that the most security conscious things in the world, not merely the CIA, so it'll be the National Security Agency of the United States, which is a very technologically powerful organization, have found precisely zero. Why? The answer for that is because there is zero. And this is the clearest thing. All this is complete uh, fake. Secondly, on the question of the structure of Huawei, yeah, the, the, structure, the, the question of Huawei is that uh, its, its CEO if, holds less than 2% of, of the shares. That's, in, if my memory is right, it's 1.97%. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's less than 2%. Right. The rest is held by the employees of Huawei. Yes, in a sense, it's a workers' cooperative. If you cease to be uh, an employee of Huawei, you have to give up the shareholding. It's repurchased by the company. So it's a type of gigantic workers' cooperative. I mean, it's so huge. It doesn't resemble those. I mean, the closest one is probably actually John Lewis Partnership in Britain, which doesn't have also has the question the shareholders are the employees of the company. Um, it does give Huawei a big competitive advantage because it doesn't have to pay dividends to external um, shareholders. If you take in the Western countries, for example, in my country, about 6% of GDP goes out to external shareholders for, of companies. Huawei doesn't have to pay this because its only shareholders are the um, employees of the company. That undoubtedly is one of the reasons why that Huawei can spend such a high proportion of its revenue, more than 10% on research and development, but it doesn't have to pay external shareholders. Instead, it can put the money into the research and development for the company. But yes, it, it is that. It's, it's, if you want to put it that way, it's probably was, I don't know, I, I, I'm not an expert in all the workers' cooperatives in the world, but it's certainly one of the largest cooperatives in the world, right? Okay. Um, why does the NDP follow such a rotten policy? Basically the same reasons of, of the Labour policy, because it uh, follows what the imperialist bourgeoisie wants. And its view is that it's against the majority of the world's population. It wants to support, tries to present the view that the uh, a small minority of the population in the, the imperialist countries should be supported. And that's, or, or as like Lenin once put it, the, the labor aristocracy. But actually, this is very changeable, in my opinion. Is it the case that the the working class of the United States or the working class of Canada is prepared to make big sacrifices for a struggle against China? I don't believe it. The last time that the American working class was asked to make big sacrifices for a struggle was in the Vietnam War. And it decided it didn't want it. At that time, that, that was how I entered politics. You know, that shows how old I am. I might enter politics through the Vietnam War. And two things were decisive in that. One was the most important of all, of course, was the struggle in Vietnam itself. But after that, it was the peace movement in the United States. 
And, and the peace movement in the United States opposed what the United States was doing because it, it damaged the American people. There were, there were many, many people dying. The economy was being damaged because of, the, of these things and uh, because, of the, because of the Vietnam War. And that's what I, well, that's what I rely upon. It, what, what, what this new Cold War is doing is uh, attempting to divert the American people from the problems in the United States to the problems outside. Okay, if you have a rank, do you like China or not? You'll probably get, you know, a majority against. What sacrifices are you prepared to make to engage in this new Cold War? I don't think very many. So that's a thing about that. Finally, on the question of the situation in China, you have to understand this. Look at the situation in China. China has lost in COVID-19, in which it was struck with the greatest impact of any country in the world, because it was not foreseen, less than 5,000 deaths. The United States has suffered more than 400,000 deaths. And the population of the United States is only one quarter, less than one quarter of that of, the, of China. What do, you think the Amer what do you think the Chinese people see? They think this is terrible. This is horrific. What the hell is happening in the West? People are dying in hundreds of thousands while we are being protected. Look at the economic consequences. The Chinese economy is recovering. It's the only economy to grow in the world, in major economy, sorry, to grow in the world in 2020. It's not incredibly high. It's about 2%. It's, that's low by Chinese standards, but it's growing. Whereas the US economy has contracted greatly. What, what do you think they think? They think what we see in the West is total chaos, hundreds of thousands of people dying, an economy plunging, and here in China, uh, we, we don't have to worry. I mean, I, I, just, just to give you an example, I have friends in China who contact me and say, well, the, why should I get the vaccine? Because there's no real risk of, of, of me getting COVID here. There's zero cases, cases of COVID. The, the, the side effects may be more serious than the risk of getting COVID, to which I reply, you know, don't rely upon this. Uh, you can have a situation which the situation in China on COVID can be invaded from outside, go and get vaccinated, but there's zero risk of getting COVID. If you're living in, in China, it's, it's so marginal, you don't have to worry about it. Whereas in, in the West, the situation is chaos. So the idea that people, what you read, that they are, they're supportive of what the government is doing. It's for obvious bloody reasons, because they've got a much bigger, bigger chance of being alive and because their economy is recovering. Why do you think that they've got such support for the government? Because they're producing a better situation. And this is the real situation of human rights. And this is why all this nonsense about the non-existent genocide in Xinjiang, for example, is being launched. It is desperate for the population, for the governments of the United States or the governments of Canada or the governments of Britain to disguise and conceal this reality from the, their peoples. Because if they understood what was going on, these governments would be totally discredited. Okay, I'm a very realistic person. I don't believe in miracles. I don't believe in things going well, but the people in the global South understand this situation you see the vaccines coming out from china going into the global south what are, what is the west doing it is it is getting all the vaccines for their own population china also russia incidentally and cuba are exporting vaccines these are countries which are aiding the population in the global south so i say please don't be uh disorientated by the undoubtedly negative situation in my country, Britain, or Canada, or the United States, where in which there is anti-Chinese sentiment being whipped up. In the majority of the world, the situation is going in the completely opposite direction. Thank you.
Thank you, John. Um, I'm not sure we will have time for a, a, another round. So I'm, this might be the last round, I think. So I'm going to try and uh, summarize a whole bunch of questions that I see here. And I also feel that given the drift of the discussion, there's one question that I very urgently want to put, and that is to all the speakers, but um, specifically to John. John, um, it's very clear it, to me that the capitalist classes of countries like the United States, well, chiefly the United States, but also Canada and Britain are actually quite divided about whether to work with China or against China. And uh, so I think I wish you, uh, I hope that actually all speakers, but you particularly would shed some light on what you think that divide is, where does it lie and how does it work? Secondly, I'm reminded by Suzanne Weiss that um, uh, the focus of this panel is on Hmong. And so I would like to just abstract from the questions I am receiving here and uh, say, uh, ask basically, uh, you know, what, what would Canada have to do today if uh, they wanted to release Hmong and uh, particularly um, whether, do, they, do the speakers feel that the new US administration and the better relationship that, well, do we have, a, does Canada have a better relationship with the US as a result of the election of Biden and what difference will it make to the Hmong Wang Zhou case? Um, I think several of the, so I'm going to just pose those questions for now, and then I'm going to read all the other questions and see if we have time for a, a final round. But uh, I will begin with John and William and Justin. John, go ahead, please. Well, I don't know what Biden is going to do exactly. I think it's quite possible he doesn't know what he's going to do exactly, because he has a uh, a very contradictory situation. We know that he has brought into the center of his administration anti-China hawks. We also know that there is big pressure from the Republicans and other people for a Cold War with China. On the other hand, because it's necessary in such matters to be extremely objective, for example, on the question of climate change, um, all the people I know in the United States whose view I would take seriously think that a Biden has also brought people who are seriously against climate change into the middle of his administration. The, the most important thing in the fight in the, against climate change in the world is an agreement between the United States and China. So we will have to see. And, and for that, I think there are some people within the Biden administration who want to cooperate with China. We will see what is the relationship of forces between these two things. In one sense, it's not absolutely decisive because the real key to the situation in China is the domestic development of China. And the events which have taken place under COVID um, have enormously in, uh, increased the power of China, both from the point of the success in dealing with the, with the virus internally and then from the point of economic recovery. After that, I consider the situation, second most situ important situation in the world is that in the global south, which is 6 billion people. They're not gonna cut off their relations with China, whatever happens, because it's what the United States is asking them to do is to tie themselves to a relatively stagnant economy in the US against their relations with a relatively dynamic economy in China, and they're not gonna do it. So I think the most strategic relationship in the world is between China and the global South. And then I think the American people are not prepared to make great sacrifice of the war. I mean, I say a, a profound influence on me was I entered politics in the movement against the Vietnam War. And I saw the American people believe that this war at that time was not in their interests. They were against it and they wanted to get out. And that's what I think is the present situation. It's one thing to have a lot of rhetoric against China. Are the American people, the US people, prepared to make sac economic sacrifice of the type that would be necessary for a huge military buildup against China? All the consequences that fall from a uh, Cold War against China? No, I don't think they are. And I don't think they are in the imperialist countries as a whole. So therefore, 
my view of the situation is, as I said, please don't get demoralized. Uh, very powerful forces are, are, are on your side. You're fighting a struggle in very difficult circumstances, but um, the general trend is going in our direction, not in the direction of what the United States does. And don't forget that Trump got crushed. Trump was basically crushed for two reasons, because he uh, uh, launched an all out racist campaign in the United States against the black population who revolted against him and because he launched an international campaign against China. He took on too many enemies and was defeated. And I think that's what will happen to anybody who attempts to follow any similar path. Thank you, John. Um, William, would you like to respond? Yes, um, I think on the issue of uh, Mao Guangzhou, yes, <clears throat> that's, that's the key issue for tonight's uh, meeting. Uh, in, in Mao's situation cannot be separated from the overall movement, the overall anti-war movement that we're trying to build here in Canada. Because Mao is just a big player in all of this, like she's caught up. She's she's like a pawn uh, between uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, Can Canada and the United States. China doesn't even have a role to play in this either. Uh, but in terms of justice, uh, China wants to have her back home. Um, so the only thing we can do, I think, is to build up the anti-war movement. And, and build up the uh, anti-Cold War movement here in Canada and use that power that we have to push for Canada to release uh, Meng Wanzhou. And that brings up the, the other question, which is the, uh, the capitalist class in Canada has been divided. Yes, it is. And I think it will become more and more divided uh, as we go along because in a time of crisis, the capitalist class will divide itself to pursue its own interests. Different factions will be pursuing its own interests. Even in the, on, the, on the issue of uh, Xinjiang, you have some Canadian companies that are invested in Xinjiang. Uh, they're there uh, mine, to mine, but they're there to build up uh, solar panels, uh, for international distribution. So, so th there are some Canadian capitalists who are in Xinjiang to make money. And when you ask them about the, uh, the genocide, the so-called genocide, they will just not say anything because they don't want you know, to uh, piss off their own government. Uh, but they know on the ground you know, what's going on in Xinjiang. So, so, so this is nothing new when, when uh, when a crisis situation comes along, uh, I don't think you can have uh, the entire Canadian bourgeoisie uh, united as one uh, because they can't, not in this day, day and age. Um, and, and the other indication of this is, is what, uh, what's going on in New Zealand because New Zealand and Australia are not walking in step in terms of, of dealing with China. New Zealand has appointed a Maori foreign minister, a woman Maori foreign minister, and he, she has refused to sign documents of the five eyes to, uh, to denounce China. Uh, she has not done that. So I don't know whether she will be pressured into doing it in the future. Uh, the New Zealand trade minister has worked out a, an agreement, a deal, uh, a trade agreement with China and he has even come up to say that Australia should be more mature in its dealings with China. So how about that? Uh, so, so this is, this is uh, you now we're seeing that you have different uh, aspects of, of, of the capitalist class uh, taking various positions depending on what kind of benefits they will get from China. And as, as the years go on over the next couple of years, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, there will be a lot of progress related to that. And I think that, that will put a lot more pressure on, on the Canadian bourgeoisie as well.
Thanks so much, William. Please go ahead, Justin. I think this will have to be the last round. So Justin, you have a few minutes and then we okay. need some time to wrap up. Okay. Uh, I'm really happy uh, that Suzanne and you, uh, Radhika, um, brought it back to Meng Wanzhou because this is, I know I, know I mentioned that uh, this whole human rights thing, where it comes from and so on, but I, uh, you know, 25 years ago started um, my political life as a letter writer for Amnesty International writing letters to governments about political prisoners. So like, and this case for me is a classic human rights campaign. This is about the, the freedom of an individual from arbitrary state power. It's about due process under the law. It's about justice. And um, if, if there was any relationship between um, those things, uh, and the Canadian state, you know, if the Canadian state had any interest in any of those things, Meng Wanzhou would never have been arrested, never mind, uh, you know, having gone through these ridiculous trials, uh, court processes that have happened so far. Um, you know, it's a perfect storm, right, of the U.S. unilateral sanctions, um, their long arm jurisdiction, uh, you know, um, the U.S. takeover of tech companies and their use of kidnapping people as, you know, bargaining chips, the Alstom example, right, um, from France, uh, all the Japanese examples, ZTE, even in China, TikTok, like there's a whole thing going on with the tech, with the U.S. attempt to take over uh, foreign tech assets. Um, but even though there's all these elements that have combined to get Meng Wanzhou into, uh, you know, arrest and arbitrary detention. I also think this is a winnable human rights campaign. I really do. And I really want to bring it back to what Miguel said, uh, that whatever, like, when you're doing a human rights campaign, they're going to say no, that's what they do. Politicians always say no, and they say no until they have to say yes. Right? That's always the case. Every human rights campaign I've ever been a part of, you, they say no until they're forced to say yes. As for the legal aspect, um, this, this whole process of extradition or deportation, whatever, is under the discretion of the immigration minister. So uh, any time they can sign on the dotted line and she's out of there, like it's totally, um, it's every minute, every minute they don't do this is, you know, a wasted minute. They're, they don't have to wait for anything to let her out. Um, all of the rest of it is is phony, phony theater. I guess that's <laughs> that's a double. It's doubling up on my metaphor. But um, now, the, I just want just to finish up on this question of divisions because it's an interesting question, right? Like the divisions of the ruling class, like the military industrial complex always wants to justify their budgets and identify enemies and so on. The tech giants probably want to defeat Huawei, take over their assets and resources. Um, but then on the other hand, outsourced companies want to keep their relationship with Chinese manufacturers. But I think in some ways, this division, these divisions are not actually real divisions because what everybody wants in common is to exploit China without you know, cooperation. They want what China, they want to get what China has, uh, and they want it on a subordinate basis. Um, so in a sense, like there, as campaigners, there's not really a division in the elite that I think we can exploit in that sense. I actually think it's more a matter of just pressure um, and, uh, you know, grassroots pressure from the bottom. Great. Thanks so much. Um, am I muted? No. Okay. Thanks so much, Justin. And uh, I guess uh, kind of we should probably bring this uh, uh, webinar to its end. Um, I would like once again to thank all the sponsors. Um, uh, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, uh, the Canadian Peace Congress, um, the um, 
uh, sorry, uh, uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, World Beyond War and Just Peace Associates. And uh, in addition, I just wanted to say that people, uh, the Hamilton uh, Peace Coalition or Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War uh, would like you to note that uh, if you could please make a donation, this, uh, the campaign is, is quite, um, uh, uh, quite expensive. So if you would like to make a donation, if you would like to join and, and help with the effort as well, please email H CSW Hamilton Coalitions to Stop the War at cogeco.ca. Uh, so having said that, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to all the panelists for an absolutely fantastic seminar. I'm sure you've all seen the uh, wonderful comments in, in the chat. And so thanks very much. And I will hand over to Rachel. Rachel, it's yours now. Yeah, I just want to echo thanks to everyone again. Thank you, Radhika, also for moderating today's panel. And thank you so much to our interpreters for helping us do this trilingual event. Thank you, Emma Zhang, Fang Sheng, Veronique Tarone, and Marina Malkova for your interpretation tonight. Um, so that's a wrap for today. Um, we will send out the recording afterwards in an email to all registrants. And with that, have, have a good rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.